here's why you've been taking your radiographs on x-rays wrong. Number one, you're not clear on what the purpose is. What do I mean by that? Well, there are basically two radiographs you need to take when you are looking at, 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 at dental implants. One is to determine whether or not the implant is encroaching on any vital structures, nerves and sinuses and such, okay? And that would be one where you capture the entire length of the implant. And doing so, you're almost always going to be guaranteed that you're going to have distortion on the implant because you can't shoot that radiograph perpendicular to the long axis of the implant. The second radiograph that you're going to take is going to be at the platform level, perfectly perpendicular to the long axis of the implant. If you get this radiograph right, what you will see is you will see very, very sharp edges to your implant. So the threads will be very crisp and sharp. And the top of the implant, the platform where it interfaces with the abutment will be perfectly flat. There will be no ellipse showing on the radiograph. If you see an ellipse with this radiograph, it's wrong. You have to do it again. Take it again. Train your team members to make sure that they always endeavor to take that radiograph perpendicular. What's the purpose of the second radiograph? The purpose of the second radiograph is to ensure that your interface is tight. In other words, whatever abutment you're placing on the implant, whether that's a healing abutment or a, or a non-functional provisional at the time, or even at the time of final delivery. You must ensure that your abutment is seated fully on your implant. The only way to verify that radiographic is through proper radiographic technique. And the way you do that is with a perfectly perpendicular picture. Threads must be sharp and the platform has to be a straight line. If you have an ellipse, it means you're shooting at an oblique angle, which means you're getting either foreshortening or long elongation of your implants. And it can very, very easily disguise a small gap between your abutment and your implant, which means it's not seated. And if it's not seated and you send them home, it means you don't have preload on your screw. And if you don't have preload on your screw, it means they're going to report back to clinic with a loose implant in a very short period of time. And that would be, that would be good news. The bad news is, is that sometimes these implants can become loose and the patient doesn't identify it right away and they only identify it after they snap the abutment screw off. In other words, the abutment screw breaks off inside the, uh, inside the implant and the prost comes out of the mouth and it's in their hand. Uh, typically that happens with men that are a little bit more stubborn and they don't come in because they're like, oh, I'll just wait six months to my next hygiene appointment to take care of this. But you want to make sure that you tell your patients when you're done delivering their, their provisionals or their finals, if at any time they notice anything that resembles a mobile tooth on their implant, they need to come in right away. Do not wait. It's not a biological concern. You're not worried about infiltration of sulcular fluids. That's not what we're worried about. What we're worried about is mechanical complications where you, where you break a, you plastically or permanently deform metal inside of your implant, where sometimes that can be very challenging to retrieve. It definitely creates a bit of stress for you and the patient. And if you actually can't get it out, if there's just no way to get it out, the implant's ruined. And so you really want to make sure you communicate to the patients, hey, if the crown is loose, come back right away. Let us get that thing tightened. But better yet, let's make sure it's tightened before we send them out the door. And that's with a proper radiograph. So in summary, two types of radiographs. One is my implant generally in the right location. It's not hitting a vital structure like an adjacent tooth, a nerve or a sinus floor or something like that. And number two, I just need to see the coronal aspect of the implant where I want to verify that, this, that the crown is seated fully. Now, a follow-up to that is this. If I want to assess the longevity of my implant, the radiographs need to be sequential. Now, the only way to do this accurately, and this comes from the literature, it's well reported in the literature, the only way to do this accurately is to have a radiographic jig. And almost no one does this. Now, why? Well, it takes effort to create a radiographic jig. You take an XCP, you squirt some registration material on there, you have the patient bite down into it, and they hold until it sets up. 
That way, every single time you take a radiograph, you use their XCP that's been customized for them, and you take the radiograph from the exact same position. So if you're truly interested in measuring crustal bone maintenance over the transitional period in the first three years and the steady state period from year three on, you would do this. Now, why is this important? Because any sort of eyeballing attempt to try to take radiographs at roughly the same position is woefully off. I mean, you are probably off by 600 microns at best in any sort of accurate measurement. And while you would say, well, is 600 microns not good enough? Well, the, the reports of, that are in the literature of people that are trying to measure crustal bone loss say things like this. My implant had plus or minus 300 microns. So if the, if the measurement value that we're trying to record is 300 microns, but the error that we're reading with our radiographs is plus or minus 600 at best, you are in the noise. That means you can just take that entire paper and throw it out. Just tear it up and throw it out. It is irrelevant. You are reading data in the noise. In engineering, you have a noise to signal ratio. You want to drive the noise level down so that the true signal, what you really care about, is obvious. If the signal is down in the noise, so it's buried in the noise, you're not going to know what the real signal is. And so I see over and over again reports on crustal bone loss, crustal wound healing during the transition phase predominantly in the first year or two before it's even stabilized where they go, we had a total value with this type of an abutment. We had a change of plus or minus 200 or 300 microns. And it's just not, it's just not readable accurately because they don't use a radiographic jig. So if you were inclined to do one of these long-term studies where you wanted to measure crustal bone loss or wound healing, you would endeavor to always use a radiographic jig. You just simply can't do these cases predictably without one. The other thing you would do is you would calibrate your sensor. And then you would also ensure that you use the same sensor throughout the entire process. And then you would also calibrate the screen. In other words, on the screen, we all have the ability with our digital radiographs to change the, the value. We can change it, we can make it brighter, or we can make it darker. And we use that to our advantage to sometimes see things like calculus or cement. We, op we increase or decrease the brightness value. Well, if you increase the brightness value and then you're using your visual eyes to see where the bone is, you're going to see more bone. If you decrease the brightness value, the bone goes away with the brightness value. And so if you're measuring using two points with a, with a digital caliper, measuring two points digitally on a radiograph, you lose your accuracy there as well. So you have to make sure that all of your images are calibrated to the same value, the same value, so that you are measuring apples to apples. So this is a bit of, a, of, of an issue that I get pretty passionate about because there's a lot of reports out there that simply don't do these two things. They don't use a radiographic jig and they don't calibrate their equipment. And so therefore, the, all they're measuring is noise. And the problem with this is that we're not paying attention collectively as an industry, we hear people present from the podium that if you use this abutment, it can give you 200 microns better crustal bone maintenance. Or if you use this type of implant, you can get this kind of, of crustal bone maintenance. And it's usually a couple hundred microns and it's clinically irrelevant because their methods are not really measuring true values. So we need to be a little bit more critical of those and we need to ask our researchers to endeavor to do a better job at controlling the variables of their experiment so that our outputs are more legitimate. And once we get more legitimate outcomes, then the conclusions that we draw from those can be used in an everyday practice. We can actually sink our teeth into that and say, this is a sound report. This is a sound experiment. There are no big major loopholes in this that would prevent us from, from understanding the premise that's being expressed in that paper. And I see it a lot. It, it, actually, it's rather uh, prolific in the, in the literature. In, in almost every uh, paper that I read about crustal bone loss or wound healing in the first year or two, I see it all the time. 
And so there are c- conclusion here is there is very little evidence that is actual in terms of the literature in the vast proponents of what I read, they just don't, they're just not doing it in a way where the conclusion is accurate. They, they're, they're, they're measuring in the noise. And this is a bit of a problem because we're building, we're building uh, methods for our team members, for our practices. We're saying this is best practice, do it this way, based on these reports that have premises and conclusions that are in the noise. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, the Smile Engineer, helping you re-engineer your practice every day.